Awesome. Well, thank you to those of you that had time to join this afternoon. Um, for those of you that I haven't met personally, my name is Carolyn Fry. I am the owner of Mortgage Lending Solutions. We are a boutique mortgage broker company, um, been lending here in the Keys for 11 years. Um, but my company's been in business for 22, and I've been in this crazy business for 32, I think. That's insane, because I'm only 29. But math, you know, don't do the math on that, please. Um, so I will share my screen, hopefully. Share. Okay. Can you all see that slide? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. Um, so today, just briefly, um, something I've done in the past um, is, is try to speak to agents that refer us business. We build a relationship together. And, and I like to talk to you all truly as if we are teammates and we're here to help kind of coach you from th this side of the desk. My, my goal is with this to sort of make sure you know the difference between what is a pre-qualification versus a pre-approval versus making loan application. Um, also, the, the importance of that pre-approval before you invest your time in the buyer and get them out house hunting um, versus spending that time on some other portion of your business, if it's better spent that way. Um, key questions to sort of ask the buyers or conversationally talk through with them to help protect your time and your business. Um, also, I'll get to some product basics, basics of how interest rates are determined and just some coaching stuff if they ask you about credit. Um, so please feel free to interrupt me and if you have questions, let me know because I, I hope this can be conversational and and maybe we're we we take an hour here um, if we <laughs> run a little long or short please um, forgive me the the one thing I will say at the very beginning the last slide of this presentation has um, a checklist for what documentation typically your buyer would need to give a loan officer when getting pre-approved. Again, that's not something you're going to be involved a ton with, but it's a nice piece of info to have um, available for them if they ask. So um, first thing I wanted to just sort of start with is I know in the Colo Banker Schmidt family that it, it, we hear Brian talk a lot about the the buyer broker um, agreement, and I, I know that's a key thing that you're working on trying to to get in place with as many buyers as possible. Um, and I know we get different buyers from all all different types of sources, right? Past customers and networking. So those are are people that are kind of warmer leads. Um, and then you have call-ins and walk-ins who aren't as warm and fuzzy and they don't know you. Um, so I don't know that we're going to have a whole lot of talking on <laughs> this Zoom call, but, but what is the, the purpose in your minds of the, the buyer-broker agreement? Anyone? Who would like to answer that question? Okay, no volunteers. Okay, Jennifer and I can answer that question. Really what it is, it's a contract between the agent and the buyer because the agent is gonna provide a higher level of service uh, just as they do through a listing agreement with the seller. But this is also uh, not only guaranteeing a higher level of service to the buyer, but it is protecting our agents from some of the things you've already mentioned about working with people who uh, may go on and work with them and then go work with someone else and ultimately do a deal with someone else. But it's a right. contract like anything else and it increases the level of professional professionalism in the eyes of the buyer, I think, and also in the agent. But um, it, it's something that protects our agents from wasting time uh, with, with people who are not serious. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it keeps um, it keeps the buyers connected to the agent. They won't flake out on you. They now they've signed something. Um, it becomes a, a loyalty agreement between the buyer yeah. and the agent. I love that that a loyalty agreement. I wish, and as I was sort of creating this presentation, I'm like, man, I wish I could get a loyalty agreement from, from every person that we pre-approve. Um, and I know that's business and that's how it works, but it, it is, it's frustrating. And we'll have this happen. I'm sure you have as agents where you get the buyer pre-approved with a lender and, and they flake on that lender in the middle of the transaction. It's, it's kind of unnerving. Um, for you, I'm sure, to have them switch gears for whatever reason. And with us, we have people get pre-approved that are referred to us by a realtor, and then they call in and they're working with someone else. It just is so unsettling for me because especially with you guys, like I, I really try to be super close with you and have great feedback. And then when they go a different direction, it's it's kind of shocking, but um, so, so yeah, this fire broker agreement, you can't get everybody to sign it every time, but it's there hopefully as a business tool to help you guys get a leg up and, and have a conversation with that buyer on how, what you will do for them and, and what respect you hopefully can get from them. Um, so with a pre-approval and pre-qualification, um, the answers are on the slide, but, but does anyone really know the difference in a pre-qualification versus pre-approval these days and, and what you see out there? I mean, simply put, isn't it just a pre-qual is you're asking them questions and trusting they're telling you the truth where pre-approval, you've actually run their credit, you know their true income and everything, their ability to purchase, I guess, really. Caitlin, you got it. That, that, that is amazing. So the, the thing, it is that simple. A pre-qualification is somebody calls me and, and we, we have a couple right now where it's like, you know, I don't want you to pull my credit yet, uh, but I, I want you, here's my income numbers and here's how much I spend each month. I just want you to trust me that everything's okay. Um, and I want you to put the letter out so that I can go house hunting. And Okay, <laughs> that, that's, that's a conversation, a very quick one. They haven't even applied. Um, Pre-approval, as Caitlin said, is, is true. We pull credit. Actually, they make with us anyway, it is loan application. So we take, you know, where do you work? Where, where do you live? How long have you been there? Um, what type of income do you make? Is it W-2? Are you self-employed? All those conversations up front to um, really kind of hone in on, oh, you're a bartender. Great. So how much of your income do you um, put on your returns? Are your tips on your returns or verifiable? Or are you mostly paid in cash and that doesn't show up on your taxes? So that is, is a pre-approval. Um, which would you all prefer to have with your buyers? <laughs> Jennifer, your face. Come on, Jennifer. Give me oh, the pre-approval. Oh, come on. Y'all hear me talk too much. <laughs> I did. I <laughs> said it. Pre-approval. Pre-approval. Yes, <laughs> pre there you go, Natalie. <laughs> It's yeah. too hard to unmute that fast. I know. I was like, I'm yelling from the rooftops over here. I'll do my video so you see me going like this. That's awesome. <laughs> there you go. Carol, um, I, have a, I have a question. When you yes. do when you do pull the credit these days, how much of a hit does the credit score take? That's an awesome question. It it is supposed to be. It it is not a big deal. Um, mm -hmm. It it is not really much of a hit at all. But there, there is some mysterious rule out there that if you um, have, you know, go car shopping and have uh, three different car dealers pull your credit 10 times in a weekend, that it's not going to hurt your credit. I totally disagree. Right. I totally see that it does hurt people's credit. So when they are shopping around for a mortgage, 
I sort of discourage it, obviously, because I have, you know, my own self-interest. Hey, I would love for you to work with us. But I would just say, if you're going to do that, be careful and have a conversation with your loan officer people first. Make sure that you just gel with someone and whoever you really kind of feel comfortable with, then go forward and let them really look at it versus having everybody pull it. Um, but so, so there you go, Natalie, the, the pre-approval letter. <laughs> and, and what I love about the pre-approval letter for you is it, it's kind of like a buyer broker agreement in a way. It tells you as the realtor, A, should they be out looking yet? B, do you even, you know, it, it waste your time on them? And I don't mean that as, as kind of negatively as it sounds, but, but oftentimes people may have a challenge they're not aware of on credit or they have an income situation come up that they think they make X, but their taxes show Y, um, things like that. So it, it helps you know, hey, I've got a viable buyer that I'm going to take out. They could write today and we could close in 30 days. Uh, and it also helps you know what price range they can be looking at. And that can work both ways. Sometimes buyers are thinking, oh my gosh, I, I know I can only afford you know this small amount and they can afford a lot more than they thought and vice versa. So that, that can be good and bad. You know, it's not like you're saying, hey, go scrape together every penny and <laughs> buy the biggest, most expensive house you can afford. But at least it helps you really hone in on what they can and can't do for their, their goals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's, that's like, just to chime in on that too, like the pre-approval, like, because we get so many from outside agents and stuff. I mean, places we don't know, you know, like say if it's coming from you, I mean, we know, we know the validity of it as well, you know, because we've worked with you and trust you. And like, I'll even go to the point, I call that lender and literally ask them like all these specific questions too, because sometimes it's just, they send you a letter. Oh, they're, you know, this amount. Like I just got one that was extremely detailed, uh, which I was pretty impressed with because it was, you know, pre-approval and they had these check boxes like, yes, buyer's credit was ran, check, or has or has not been, or, and they nice. were able actually to check the boxes and do that. But sometimes they just put the amount and it's like, okay, is it a second home? Is it this? Is it that? <laughs> like, right. <laughs> so yeah, that pre-approval is so important. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, and sometimes I'm sure you, you, well, it's nice. You call and, and check the validity of it. Is that because you have the buyer or they walked into your listing? Usually if it's, if I get a pre-approval from like a buyer's offer, I'll, I will call if it's my listing and, and no. So that way I know, and you know, can maybe start that conversation with that, with that lender, if that's who they decided to work with. Right. Especially if it's somebody I don't know. I mean, I feel like anybody could go into Microsoft Word and type up a letter. <laughs> I mean, to be completely <laughs> honest, true. like it's, you know, so oh my God. Hey, I'm sure that has happened. Yep. So I, uh, yep, that's what I do. <laughs> and I have never even thought of that. That's mm -hmm. frightening. Um, but yeah, it, and, and what we see too sometimes is, you, you know, uncomfortable buyer scenario is kind of a segue into this, but I, I swear two or three times in the last couple of weeks, we got calls from panicked agents just in the middle of contract freaking out because, oh my God, we're halfway through the process and la, 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 the letter, the pre-approval letter really wasn't a, a well done pre-approval. It was the, while well, we just kind of threw everything at the wall and uh, threw the letter out, you know, the loan officer was super busy and they just pump out the letter or they just are like, I, I don't know. And then, <laughs> hey, they can't do it. Can you do it? It's like, well, we will certainly try and maybe we can make some magic, but it's a lot to, um, I, I just hate that when you, you know, you're in contract and suddenly you're going sideways and you're trying to run and find a lender to pick up the pieces. Um, so it's in this, this similar to it, it's like, you can't, uh, looking back 
backwards on those, I guess. It, it, when you have the buyers that are referred to you and they won't get a pre-approval, what, what do you do? It, it's a business decision. Do you take them out knowing that they won't or do you pass them off and, and just say, hey, okay, I'm going to let this person walk and maybe they're going to close with somebody else, somebody even in my office. That's, I'm sure, a very difficult thing. And how do you all decide that? Is it if, if you're busy, your workflow? Well, I think... Um... There's a lot of agents on this call and I'd like to hear from them. Uh, it's a business decision on their part. But yeah. I, I think it's also a business decision, decision based on their experience, their previous experience. And we'll find that the more seasoned agents are probably going to take a harder line for that. The newer agents, and I can't blame them, uh, may not do that. They, they may you know, be a little more... Uh, I won't say forgiving, but they may not, they may continue to work with the individual. But, um, you know, the more seasoned agents, I think, will take a different view of that because they don't have the time. Right. Right. And, and that, that is understandable to me, too. And I think about that, like, it's, it's tough. If, if it's a slower time and the phone is ringing less or your walk-ins are less or, or you're, you're, uh, networking isn't going as well. And then you get the kind of bossier person like, oh, no, I'm fine. It's great. Natalie, Caitlin, take me out. Let's go. I mean, uh, something I that helped this in our marketplace was um, during COVID, a lot of sellers would not even show the property without you having that. So I think if people weren't doing it in their, in their business prior to that, that has just continued on because still even you, a lot of people see even in the higher end homes or, you know, the luxury versus the regular, it says like, I mean, I still have that where I go to set up a showing, I have it. And they're like, we need, we need to see the pre-approval or proof of funds before we'll even set up the showing. So, I mean, I think now it's a standard on both sides when you have a mm -hmm. listing and you have a buyer. So I think that's I think that's a great point. I used to always say blame the seller and say the seller doesn't, you know, mm -hmm. uh, believes that we are bringing pre-approved or, you know, yeah. uh, uh, able buyers into their house. And I'm not doing my job. Uh, if I take somebody to the house that I don't even know they can buy it. So right. I always blame the seller. I like that. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Um, but yeah, so it, again, it, it's, it's, it's similar, but different. I know, but it, when you're looking for listings and you go on the listing appointment and the seller's like, oh yeah, I want you to list it way up here. And it's really not worth way up here. <laughs> do, do you pass on that listing or not? I know these are things only you guys can personally answer. Um, but it, it, what I've always tried to do it and just again conversational here this is not rocket science and this is not like the the uh end all be all answers but these are sort of my my spidey questions that i would love for you to to sort of memorize like your superheroes um that again so you you can't get them to get a pre-approval, but, but there's some different cues and questions that you can ask and, and answers you can pick up on um, just through talking with them. Um, and one thing I will just preface is in, in no way do I think you guys should get involved and be like, hey, let me take your loan application or, hey, let me talk to you about rates. Um, let me talk to you about mortgage products. Please I, I would say, no, please do not do that. <laughs> there are so many products and changes and guidelines, um, even with the pandemic, as you guys probably know, where it's like, wow, we have all these rules and now we have an extra layer of rules um, that just is, it's constantly a full-time job to keep up with and multiple products. But um, anyway, th these are some things that, 
I think are key for you to just kind of think about and maybe even keep this little list on your desk or in your little folder for when you're doing buyer buyer presentations. But when you're talking with someone, it, it's really interesting. Do you, oh, I have really good credit, you know, okay. Um, do you happen to know your credit score? Not that they're gonna necessarily tell you that or that you're gonna feel comfortable with that. But if they do, it it's just intriguing sometimes how much people will talk <laughs> about themselves and, and, and how much they'll disclose to you. But, but it's very interesting how sometimes people will call, oh, I have awesome credit and their score is a 685. And, and you know, that is not a horrible score, but that is not exceptional credit. Um, and vice versa. Oh man, I, I don't know. I'm kind of worried about my credit. We'll pull it. And it's, a 780 that the person was worried because they paid their Home Depot card, you know, five days after the due date once. <laughs> so it's, it's all kind of a perception thing, um, which again, you just need to let a loan officer look at it. But um, so asking about that a little bit, if, if you know this person is self-employed, um, one thing we see in the keys, and I know you all are aware of it, but I would say 60% of the folks, maybe even more that, that we help buy their primary residence, second home and investment properties, they're self-employed. And it's not just, oh yeah, I have a company. It's sometimes we have, you know, five or six companies. And so that person they they may sound i had a gentleman this afternoon j just say it, they may sound like they're really well off and they may be in a certain uh, arena of looking at your financial net worth say but he said the sentence to me well we do some really creative stuff with my taxes and it's like well there you go if you hear that when you're doing your buyer appointment, I would just say, be really leery when you hear that sentence or, you know, yeah, well, I, I do. I have a lot of tip income, but, you know, I don't really deposit it. It's in my safe and la, la, la. It's like, okay, <laughs> these are the cues to be careful of. Um, and also as taxes go, oh, yeah, well, I haven't even filed my, my 19 or, or my 20 and 21s yet, blah, blah, blah. So that, again, you may just save that in your brain. If they have not filed their returns, it is not okay. Unless they're doing one of these unique kind of what we call non-conforming loans that, that I can talk about a, a little bit in a second here. But um, so if you hear even that sentence, like, yeah, we haven't filed, we got an extension for 20 and we always get an extension. So we're doing that for 21. It's, it's really, I would not get in the car with them. Um, or I would ask, oh, okay. So is your account working on that? Will there be like, are they going to, get 20 done and 21 by April 15th or, you know, what's your timeline on that? Um, if they own properties, how many? Uh, again, um, maybe something you wouldn't think of, but th there are rules and underwriting out there that, okay, uh, you own a property or two, great. If you own a whole lot of properties, it can be challenging for some lenders. Um, it, it, and there's different companies that will do different, how do I say this? Some companies will allow you to have up to four or five mortgages total in your credit, others like up to 10. And then if you have more than 10 mortgages or more than 10 properties, they do not want to play in the, the arena of that because they don't want to, um, have more risk in their portfolio by joining in. So um, that's just, again, another thing to sort of listen to is, oh, they own a whole portfolio of, you know, 75 properties, holy smokes. That's not just your quick and easy loan approval. Um, 
and do they need to sell a house, you know, before house hunting? Um, kind of jumping around a little bit, but like the down payment money and selling a house, obviously in our market right now, I know as listing agents, there's not a lot of people that want to tolerate a contingent offer upon a sale. Um, and if your buyer is is that person that's like, hey, I'm selling the house in Utah, I need to get the down payment funds out of that before I can buy in the keys. Um, I know that double move is not anybody's thing they want to do, but those questions up front are super critical. Um, and the fact that they make sure they're having someone look at their debt ratio and you know, can they close on a second house before selling the first one with without that down payment um, money coming from the, the primary home? Or, you know, is the debt ratio going to work if they have two homes at the same time? All of that strategy uh, for your buyer. Uh, and the other thing, so obviously bankruptcy, short sale foreclosure, <laughs> These are things that I'm sure you would be aware of if you heard uh, someone bring that up. But it's it's interesting too, even on that, like we had a gentleman close just this week, um, Annalise referred to us, great guy, was pre-approved, and, and don't ask me how, but he was pre-approved with a local bank in the Keys. Yeah, he's out house hunting with Annalise, gets into contract. They're a third of the way through and the deal falls apart because they turn him down because he has a foreclosure on his credit. Well, how the heck did they miss this foreclosure? I don't know. Um, conventional lending with that buyer says that foreclosure needed to be four years or longer in the past. It was three years and a month. So he was declined by the bank. Um, we were able to help get him approved and get him closed. Um, but using a, a non-traditional mortgage product. So that guy was able to close. His rate is six and a quarter. I know it makes our ears hurt <laughs> right now, the, these rates. And that's even higher because of this. But in theory, what's awesome is we got him closed. Hopefully down the road, we'll help him um, refinance when that time has expired and that's seasoned the, the foreclosure. But these are things, again, to just be keen on if you hear. Uh, and also just the property type, two to four units, um, manufactured homes. And those are things you guys know already, I'm assuming, but the, the things that are a little unique and out of norm, um, those are things that are a little more difficult to do. So any questions on any of those? Any of the strange things I just went through? Carolyn, I, this is Karen Prince. I have a situation that I um, have a house under contract. I am the listing agent and I called the mortgage lender and he won't return my calls. He has sent me an email saying it's gone into um, underwriting, um, but he made the comment to the buyer's agent that he does not babysit listing agents, that he doesn't talk to them. He called me on Friday wow. and he wanted to know if it was my number so he could give it to the more, I mean, to the appraisal. Um, it's not the appraisal company, but it's whoever the management company that's assigned the appraisals. But he says, he won't call me. Is that a practice that you do that you don't speak to the listing agent if they give you a call to ask? But like, I want to know how strong this guy is because it's a 90%, 10% down, 90% loan, jumbo loan. Ooh. And it just makes me nervous. Is it owner occupied? Do you know? Yes, it is the house. Okay, is that's good. Um, that's good. The I'll I'll just say it, it, it's interesting because I I feel like when when you all refer a buyer to us, we get them pre-approved, and we're kind of this team. You go out, you get them in in contract, and then 
we get a call from the listing side, we absolutely talk to them. And we're just careful. We don't over disclose anything financially that we need to be private about, but the service I think should be there. I mean, that's just kind of a courtesy and isn't that <laughs> what you should do to help facilitate the transaction? I don't know. I find it really, I mean, he's from Fort Lauderdale and then he had the audacity to ask me if I would refer him any new business because he wants to break into the keys. And I don't think he realized that the buyer's agent told me his nasty comment, but I'm like, is that a common practice for all mortgage lenders not to talk to a listing agent or is it just this arrogant guy? <laughs> I think he just has an ego and <laughs> can't yeah. get over it. <laughs> yeah, get over it. Uh, you know, I've run into it every once in a blue moon uh, where you've got a non cooperated uh, co-broke on the co-broke side, the loan officer, and it's too bad because you know, everybody's a team trying to get a deal done and we are all, all in the same boat. You don't get paid until the thing comes together. So right. let's all work together. So unfortunately, um, yeah, it's somebody that has an ego and acts like he's in charge of the whole, you know, universe on this thing. But that's not, that's not right. That's not good professionalism as far as I'm concerned. Wow. Okay. So it's not a standard practice. It's just this guy. I've never run into that before. And I was really just calling him to ask him, is there any way we can close earlier and how's it going just to touch base with them? Yeah. Because when he called me on Friday, it was like a two second call. Is this your number? Yes, this is my number. You just called it. Okay, goodbye. Uh -huh. And I was like, okay, Mr. Personality. But um, it's strange to me because it is it is a jumbo loan at 90%. And that's just, and it's well over 1.5 million. So I'm like, okay. Right. This is Anyway, all right. Thank you. He's very important. That's that's he's very important. Okay. Um, but you're right. And again, um, kind of flowing into products a little bit. And Karen, that's very smart. I'm going to flip actually slides for for a second. But obviously, there. So the jumbo loans or larger loan sizes in Monroe County over seven ten seven hundred right now. It changes every year depending on. Um, Sometimes it'll increase depending on what Fannie and Freddie decide. Um, conventional government loans, and then there's non-conforming kind of outside the box loans. But on jumbos, um, it, it's interesting because each product, th there's just so many different things that determine what's your rate, how much down, are you gonna occupy it? Are you not gonna occupy it as a second home? But jumbos are very unique in there are 10% down owner occupied second home. Uh, I'm sorry, owner occupied jumbos. Um, it, and we're seeing some of these outside of the box lenders pop into the market with different product, uh, products where it's like, oh, we'll do a jumbo with just 5% down owner occupied. Um, it, and some really different things that sort of are out, out of the norm, they're pricing them accordingly. So you're gonna have a higher rate to do that, but you'll see some you know, unique buyers that are like, hey, I'd rather keep my money in the markets than, than liquidate and put it into a house where it's sort of stuck in the equity of the home. So yeah, I want to do the jumbo that's at a higher rate with 5% down. Or if you want the better rate, then you need to, you know, put more down to get into a better, better uh, interest rate on that long-term product. But it's, it's kind of good to know. And, and again, it's on the realm of Please don't try to memorize any of this stuff, but um, it, it, obviously the, there aren't any, you know, zero or 3% or down jumbo loans out there. And obviously a 10% down jumbo, it, it does sound like, wow, that's kind of rare. And, and it is. So um, he switched. The thing is, last week, you know, two weeks into the contract, he switched lenders because the first lender wanted to give him 6.99. So he freaked out over that. So right. on the second guy, and it's like 4.85 is what they told him. Interesting. 
See, and I really think that is, that's one of these kind of unique products that, that they're getting. Um, and then, then you are shopping them against each other, I guess, to go get that re reduced rate on it. But, um, so any other questions about this, uh, the, the spidey questions or odd, uh, things you pick up on with, with buyers at all? Okay, well, just to kind of summarize this again, if in conversation you have just sort of that gut feel or something seems a little wrong or you, you just sometimes you know instinctually something is a little off sounding, I'll just say this, if you have two, two buyers on your schedule that day and one is a little off in your mind and your uh, realm of like these questions or something seems a little slight i would lean towards the other one and definitely on these folks if you're busy try to capture their business absolutely you want to be there you know have them sign the buyer broker agreement but also encourage the pre-approval or i don't know it's it's uh spending your time in a different direction might be smarter. Well, so. there's one way I think that, that when I talk to the agents, uh, you know, to kind of segue into this with the buyer, if they're not really too sure how to really open the discussion is just so you know, especially in this market, um, if you do decide, do you want to make an offer on a home? The seller and the listing agent are going to be requiring a copy of your pre-approval or your pre-qualification letter, or if it's cash, certainly, although we're not talking about right now, your proof of funds. So you set them up, and then if they back away from that, you know, what do you mean? Well, you know, this is going to have to be readily available. It may have to accompany the offer. That will sometimes smoke out what's really going on. Right. That's an awesome cue for you. Like, okay. It, it, and it's funny. I had an agent say this along. It was Brian Tribble, who uh, obviously he moved away a long time ago, but he's like, it's just amazing. At holiday time, just watch how much your phone rings and how much people will run you around and have you work your tail off because they're down on vacation and they want to look at houses and they're all excited about, ooh, a vacation home. And then they leave and you did, you know, you worked your whole holiday season on nothing. So it's that, that yeah. smoke and mirrors, like kind of put up or, or shut up in a way. I like that. And like to Speaking add on to, to Ruth's thing, um, too, even like most of the time, like I said, when, when you're, even before you go out on the showing, a lot of the agents have it right there in the agent remarks I'll take a clip of that and just say, look, we can't even show this property until we have this from you. Right. Like this is not our right. requirement. It's their requirement as well, too. So that's just another way to do that. Right. And and flip it on them. Say, listen, if, yeah. if it was your house and and you were, you know, putting it on the market, do you want just anybody walking through your house? You know, you want to make sure that the people coming in the door can actually buy it. Um, right. So I always flip it on them. I love that. And, and what a waste of time, truly, and energy and just everyone's emotions. It's very emotional as, as a buyer and a seller to have the person go through. You get into contract. You spend all that time back and forth on a Saturday night at 11, of course, you know, to, to get it signed. And then something falls through. It's, it's just a, a part of the business I wish we could somehow make perfect. It's never going to be, but um, I, I love those, those <laughs> leaning on the seller. It, again, it's, this is kind of like your second level of, of buyer broker agreement when they're not paying cash, try to, to make sure they're legit. Um, the other thing, and these slides just kind of show you basics. Again, you can put less down on a home if you're going to occupy it. You can put as little as three to 5% down on a home. A lot of people don't even know that, which again, is 
something I should be better about on social media, just like, hey, do you realize you don't need 20% to buy, buy a property? Um, so this just gives you kind of some, some basics, uh, minimum scores, minimum down payments. Um, but the other thing that I thought I would touch on today is just um, as far as as interest rates, and I know everyone, we all want a great deal. That's what, what we hope, you know, to go out, buy a house and get the best deal possible. And rates right now are the highest they've been in four years. Um, so it's an interesting uh, market with, you know, trying to sell and rates have gone up a percent and a half since January 1st. But this is sort of how, and my team laughs at me, but, you know, when the phone rings, hey, what are your rates today? It's like, okay, rates on, on what? Um, is, it, is it a purchase? Is it a refinance? Do you live in it? Is it a second home? Is it, is it uh, investment? And so truly it's so technical. It's based on their credit score. So again, the, the folks that won't give us their, their credit won't allow us to pull but they want a shop rate, that again is kind of like, wow, well, let me pull that out of my magic eight ball here, what your score is, and I'll tell you what your rate's going to be. Um, but credit score, the type of loan, um, the type of property that it is, if it's a condo, it has a bit of a, of a rate hit um, manufactured, another additional hit to the rate for just the type of property. Um, occupancy, how much or how little you're putting down, um, loan amount, and, and uh, location, meaning state by state. So these are all things that, and again, I know I've said, please don't try to memorize this and please don't <laughs> quote rates or take applications. But it's, it's interesting when people, I'm sure, are asking you all often, hey, what's the rate today? Like, that's a really loaded question. Um, and I've had agents before literally kind of quoting them. And then we're pre-approved already. They get into contract and they're mad at me because I, I didn't know the rate that the realtor <laughs> was telling them. So um, just kind of something to know, but kind of, kind of lean away from. So, um, Karen, and again, question, this is Karen, what does property location have to do with the loan? Is it because like it's on the water, not on the water? Oh, no, just state by state. It, it does vary by state. So, um, and then credit do's and don'ts. Uh, I'm once someone, and, and I think you all know this, but I'll just sort of explain again in a little bit more detail. But when someone does get pre pre approved, we try to coach them. Please don't go out and buy anything. Please don't go shop for your new furniture or go shop. Just don't buy it yet or put it on a credit card that you already have open. Um, but don't have your credit pulled and please wait to really do anything formal until right after closing. And I know a lot of times, especially the second home buyers, invest, investors, they're coming down from out of town. They want to have furniture delivered the day of closing and, and they don't have much time because they don't live here. I get it. Um, but it can really mess things up um, terribly if, if they're not, not careful or if they're in the credit scenario where our debt ratio is really tight and they barely qualify and then they go open something up with a payment. So um, just good things to tell them. Um, what was the other thing? Oh, and, and the other thing that I, I don't know if you all know this, but so literally if I pull credit today on someone and they are in contract next week with a closing date of, I don't know, say it's May, May 15th. So in underwriting now, they do sort of a, a soft repull of credit right before closing. 
Um, and there's these other fraud checks and things that are done with technology that are super smart for them to do as underwriters. But it's amazing even to me, having been in this for so long, that we'll get asked questions at the end to ask the, the buyer, like, hey, why did they have, you know, this card open up or how come that balance didn't go down or it's it's just really kind of interesting so we truly try to coach them um to just be very still once your credit is pulled if you do you know need to have an emergency and you need to trade in a car like call us so we can say okay yeah keep your car payment about the same or um coach them sometimes you know, it's not an issue at all if if they have great enough income and low enough debt. But on the flip side, if they're a family that's tight with credit, uh, debt debt to income ratio, and they open credit, it it could kill <laughs> their house hunting with you guys. So, um, so any questions on any of that stuff or anything else? Nope. Okay. Um, and this just is me telling you a little bit more about us in a broker versus a bank. Again, banks are wonderful. There is nothing wrong with working with a bank. We have local lenders that are great at banks here. But the, the one thing that I think is a key advantage of working with a broker like us is when we do get them pre-approved, like Annalise's gentleman that we closed this week, had we approved him in the beginning and say we missed that foreclosure uh, timing seasoning on his credit, the cool thing is say, say we sent it to underwriter one and realized, oh my God, Carolyn made a mistake. We missed this timing thing. We don't have to start over again we literally can shift it to another underwriter our, under our umbrella. We're not pulling credit again. They don't have to reapply. They don't have to resend us all their financials, taxes, pay stubs, W-2s. Um, we've already got it. So it just saves a lot of time having, having all that under one umbrella because we can truly do big fat jumbo loans with little down, a lot down, conventional government and these new kind of um, bank statement loans for self-employed people and uh, investor loans for for those where they really just look at it almost as a commercial loan. Um, does the property produce enough income to pay its payment? If it does, the, the and the credit's good and some other <laughs> good things like appraisal, it, it, it kind of works. So that's just kind of the, the difference, if you will, between a, a bank that sort of has a couple of products here and there and us where we sort of have all of it um, under our umbrella. So and we promise to take very good care of you uh, and give you lots of communication and, and talk to you before there's problems <laughs> up front. Um, no application fee or credit bureau fee, um, and we do. We we do a lot of rate shopping, so they don't have to go apply a lot of different places. Um, and the last thing uh, that hopefully you guys know is that we definitely love to give back to you uh, to the Coldwell Banker Schmidt Charitable Foundation for any loan that closes with us. I personally donate. Um, 150 per deal and stair stepping that up for agents that have been working with us in the last couple of years and for those that haven't in the last couple of years we're we're kind of doing the Brian Schmidt I'm gonna double dip and <laughs> like give you three hundred dollars for your first two uh closings of the year with us to the foundation so would love to drive those numbers up with you and help help give back even more so any Carolyn? other? Yeah, yes. I do. While we have a couple of minutes here, um, could you just briefly give everybody a quick um, tutorial? I don't know if that's the right word, 
of the difference between a conventional FHA and VA? Absolutely, yes. So, I'll start with VA. So obviously if you have a person active in the military or um, is a veteran, we would need to check to make sure they have certificate of eligibility um, for the VA loan, but it is a wonderful product. We have a lot of veterans in the keys. So it's literally a zero down payment loan. It's the only one out there. Um, and they have no private mortgage insurance required. So it's, it's a great product. Um, I believe we can do up to 710,000 on that loan. It, like they go buy a house for 710 and they put zero down. It's, it's phenomenal product, great rates. Um, FHA is sort of considered, it's, it's another government product, sort of considered a first time buyer or slightly bruised credit loan. Um, but I don't, I don't even look at it that way. The FHA is kind of a, an awesome way to get into a house with just three and a half percent down. And if you have a debt ratio issue where uh, conventional loans, really good credit folks, but tighter loan uh, guidelines. So your debt ratio on that, which is what you make versus what you spend on all your bills each month. It is a lower guideline and FHA will let that be a little higher. So for some kind of younger buyers or those with a household that just doesn't have a ton of income and uh, they're just <laughs> living life, FHA can sometimes help people buy that a conventional loan won't. So um, really good rates on FHA and conventional actually has a little bit higher rate than these government loans. So um, conventional is like three to 5% down. And the, the thing about these loans, these four loans on the left, four buckets on the left is they are all full doc loans, meaning two years, typically two years of taxes, W-2s, recent pay stubs, um, pretty standard, what I call vanilla loans. Um, and then the jumbo is obviously so, sort of like conventional, but bigger <laughs> loan, loan amount. And jumbos are lovely. They have extra hoops though. So it's, it's, we definitely need them in the keys and use them a lot, but those folks need to often give even more documentation than these other um, loans require because there's more skin in the game for that lender that's like, hey, if we're lending you a million bucks, we, we want to see your dog's left paw print, you know? So they, they uh, sometimes will ask for additional um, things from folks. And then these, these non-conforming type loans just, to kind of finish out it, what is wonderful about these. We've done a lot of these, even for some agents um, that, so you have really good credit, but you're self-employed and your income tax is either you're, you're a young business or you have that accountant that's doing a bang up job writing off all your expenses. So you may make, you know, two, three, 400,000 a year, but your income tax return makes it look like you make 50. And you're trying to buy a house in the Keys where you very rarely are buying a house with income that's 50,000 on a tax return, right? So these bank statement loans will allow that um, self-employed buyer to average their deposits over the last 12 to 24 months, depending on what you give us. And so literally, if they're depositing money each month, they're just not showing a ton of income at the end of the year on their returns. What's nice is that buyer can get pre-approved and close. Um, again, it's at a higher rate though, because it's not the traditional vanilla conventional loan. Um, but it's a, a fantastic way for self-employed buyers to 
be able to finance properties. And in the long term of rates over the last 50 years, where we're so spoiled lately with, with low, low rates, a six or seven percent rate really is not that bad. Um, but that's what they'd sort of be looking at for that type of product. So thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. Carolyn, can you explain um, when you get a loan and you um, like FHA loan and you have to have mortgage insurance up to 20% down? So say somebody puts three to five percent down, they have mortgage insurance, but once they hit the 20%, does the mortgage insurance fall off? Awesome question. So on conventional loans, yes, it absolutely does. It, it used to be not that way and, and some it's been a while but somebody did the right thing governmentally and changed that so that when when um sort of the data computer wise would, would spit out like okay well karen prince now has you know 80 percent on her mortgage versus what it's worth that PMI will fall off on its own conventional the fha mortgage loan though it does not so that is one negative, it, and that didn't used to be that way, um, but it changed to where that, that is a, a big negative about that product is we, we will use it if we have to, but that FHA is on there for, that PMI is on there for life. So it literally, you could put down 50% and get an FHA loan and you're still gonna have PMI. So um, definitely something we try to get folks um, educated on up front so they know about that and then help get them refinanced, hopefully when credit or whatever that financial situation is um, rectified enough so that we can, can refinance them. So if somebody has 20% down for a $500,000 house, not that there's any $500,000 house anymore, <laughs> But say they have um, 100000 to put down on a 500000 house. Are you going to put them in an FHA or are you going to put them in a conventional? So it's a great question. If we can go conventional, we would want to go conventional. Absolutely. Because they would not require PMI. You're putting down 20%. Why on earth would you want the loan that has PMI? But um, FHA will allow a little bit bumped bumped up credit. Right. So sometimes that might be the right product to use if conventional is going to decline them uh, or if their debt ratio is, is too high. So literally they, they put down 20%, they'd still have PMI, but they could qualify for more house with an FHA loan than conventional because they let you close with a higher debt ratio. And a lower credit score with FHA, is that yeah. correct? Yes. And do you know what the threshold is for your for someone's credit? Or is it does it is that a sliding mark? I mean, so this one week to the next. FHA, it's actually, I don't even want to say this, but it typically 580 or above. Okay. And we have lenders right now where we're seeing them solicit us that want us to do business for them, where it's 550, even 500. It's like, holy smokes. That's just a painful, long loan process typically. But we, we have some of those things popping back up. What's, um, Carolyn, what's the uh, Monroe County FHA limit on purchase? It is... It is seven ten, I believe. Wow. Okay. Wow. It's I knew it going up uh, in the last six months. So. Right. Right. Now, Carolyn, if somebody buys a house that's eight hundred, and it they can only finance. Oh well, it's not that's not say nine hundred, and they want to do FHA three percent down. Does you just do FHA to seven ten, and then conventional the rest, or how does that work? Or can they only look at houses under seven ten? Correct. They they would need to get gift funds from their rich relative to put down the difference, or say the you know government um, if there is an incentive for down payment assistance, 
Um, I know Chris Davis, I think, is on this call. We had a buyer um, actually do that a year or two ago. Um, so that is allowed. That that sort of second mortgage government entity um, can help. That was the SHIP program out of Key West. Obviously, that's kind of location specific, I think. But um, right. that can help, or they do have to just buy lower. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is Monroe County still giving money for first-time buyers? I think something just passed on that, yeah. right? I don't know specifics. They still are, but I don't know the specifics either. That would be interesting to find out. Yeah. And we will allow, allow that. That sounds harsh, but, but truly like the underwriting folks need to approve that source, but if it's a government entity, we absolutely can, so. Carolyn, is there a seasoning on gifts? Not really, for the buyer to have yeah, if, they're, if they're gifted from mom and dad. No. Amount, is there a seasoning on it anymore? No, the, I will tell you this though, typically if, mom and dad give money, they wanna see that mom and dad had that money by looking at their checking statement. Um, but it's, there is no time timing on that, so yeah. But don't lenders look at where all the cash comes into somebody's account and they wanna yes. know where, where it's coming from? Yeah, they'll go, they'll go back. I had a deal where they went. They kept going back because it was like two two parents they were divorced that were putting their money in and they wanted to see okay where did this money come from and one of them the deposit had just happened and they're like okay where did that money come from so they want to see the paper trail right thank you carolyn you are welcome thank you all yes good basic knowledge thank you very much We've got this recorded, so we'll make sure and push it out to everybody. And um, awesome. oh, there's puppies. <laughs> These are my co-workers, Waffles, Waffles and Lucky, and, and Waffles in her very uh, smart glasses there. Waffles, underwriting loans. That's right. Um, this I have my one more question, Carolyn. Sure. What is the highest credit score you can get? Oh, gosh. I Is it I, 900? I think it may be, but I don't know that I've seen anything above like an 850, really. So if somebody goes, I got 880, and you're like, yeah, sure. <laughs> that is pretty darn rare. <laughs> I'll tell you, anything over a 780, though, is magnificent, and, and they're going to get a great deal. So, um, But anyway, that's my my team, Heather and Robin, that help uh, help me try to make magic every day. If you guys ever have questions on any of this material, feel free to give us a call. And that's my Pennsylvania team up north in snow. So they're on there just to just to make, you know, make them known. You so. still have an Ohio team? Didn't you have an Ohio team? Well, Heather and Robin cover Ohio too. So uh heather actually lives up in the snow so we like to pretend she's she's not <laughs> but she is she's up in the cold and robin and i are the keys girls so uh, well, but thank you all so much good luck um you, with, with all of this and anytime i can help with questions i'm happy to do so appreciate you all and and wish you so much luck with trying to wrestle your buyers to get pre-approved Thanks so much, Carolyn. We really Thank appreciate you. it. And a wealth of knowledge. Right. Thank you. Good. Take care. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.